Welcome to our video lecture on ethology. Our essential understanding for today is that natural selection favors specific types of behavior. We've talked about natural selection in the past. We focused more on physical traits. Today we're going to look at how natural selection can actually favor behaviors. Our objectives, the majority of today is going to be a review of evolution and natural selection. We're going to then define ethology and we're going to discuss some examples of behaviors that are selected for by natural selection, which is basically the definition of ethology. Um, lots of vocab today because this is a big review day. If you want to pause and look any of these guys up, feel free. Otherwise, here we go. So evolution is defined as change in heritable characteristics of a species over time. Originally, well, maybe not originally, one early theory was um, Lamarck's theory of acquired traits. And his thought was that there were some giraffes and they stretched their necks and that made their necks longer when they had babies that had longer necks that stretched their necks and so their babies had even longer necks um not good good thinking but not the best thinking um charles darwin is the basis of our understanding of evolution today and it's more about those inherited traits organisms that have traits that allow them to survive and have offspring are going to pass those traits on to their offspring and this is the idea of natural selection, survival of the fittest. So we've got lots of evidence for evolution. Um, of course, the fossil record shows us that things have changed, organisms have changed over time. Selective breeding or artificial selection, kind of like these doggos here, we can see over time that us humans choosing which dogs mated with which dogs, we were allowed to choose the traits that were passed on to offspring. Um, homologous structures like these pentadactyl limbs right here, uh, all these mammals have very similar underlying bone structures showing evidence of a common ancestor despite having different functions in these different limbs. Vestigial structures are also um, evidence for evolution, kind of like the hip bones in whales or uh, tail bones in us humans. And then molecular biology really is the best piece of evidence for evolution. So this table is showing us the amino acid sequence for a protein called cytochrome C, which is involved in metabolism, um, in, in cellular respiration. And so we have mice and horses and humans and yeast, so a fungus, and we can see that a lot of the amino acids in this protein are very similar, maybe only a few differences here and there. Showing that similarity in amino acid sequence of these proteins provides some evidence of a common ancestor. We can define a species as a group of related individuals that can interbreed to produce fertile offspring. Um, there are some limitations to this definition. Bacteria don't really interbreed. They reproduce via binary fission, so it's hard to talk about species of bacteria. We also have these hybrid plants like these tomatoes um, where we combine different species and end up with some offspring, and sometimes these guys can um, produce offspring. And then we also have this idea of allopatric isolation where we have organisms over here and organisms over here, and maybe they could interbreed if they could jump over the Great Wall of China, but they can't just because that physical barrier is in the way. Um, so remember that populations can change over time into se separate species. This is known as speciation, the formation of new species. A couple different ways that this selection and therefore speciation can occur. Um, stabilizing, this is where it's best to be average. So we might start with some outliers, but over time being on the ends is not good. It's best to be average. Think about human birth weight. Um, it's bad to be super tiny, it's bad to be super big, and so a lot of us tend to be right there smack in the middle. Directional um, selection, a, an example is industrial melanism and those peppered moths where 
Originally, it was better to be a light color because the light colored guys blended in on the clean tree bark, but then soot covered the trees and now you can barely see this darker colored moth right there. And then disruptive selection. This one's kind of weird where average is the worst. It's better to be one of the extremes. And an example is this rock pocket mouse. Um, in the western United States there are these lava flows and it's good to be a dark colored mouse on the lava flow you hide well it's good to be a light colored mouse in the sand in the desert just off the lava flow because you blend in pretty well those guys in the middle they're easiest to see and they are most uh, they are fed upon the most um, so populations can diverge those different selective pressures in different environments there are also reproductive isolation pieces that prevent groups from interbreeding and then over time those different groups that can't breed together anymore might evolve into separate species some of these examples of reproductive isolation can be temporal this is all based on time so you might have one group that goes into heat in the spring and another group that goes into heat in the fall and if the two organisms are not mating at the same time of year they're not going to mate uh, we can look at some of the behaviors that are different for different groups, and that is basically the study of ethology. I'm going to talk about that a lot more at the end of today's um, PowerPoint slides. And then physical uh, isolation might pop up. For example, if um, the continents are drifting away from each other, and groups that used to be able to uh, migrate and find each other and breed if the continents are drifting away, South America and Africa are no longer next to each other. That's definitely a physical barrier <laughs> to species staying in contact with each other. Uh, we can use cladograms to show speciation over time. So this is the longest ago uh, common ancestor of all of the organisms on the page. And let me show that something happened where speciation occurred these hagfish went one way the other organisms went a different this trait jaws is common to everything that comes after this little tick mark so hagfish do not have jaws everybody else does be careful we might think that haha pigeons and mice are as equally closely related to each other as our mice and chimps since they are all next door to each other but in fact these guys are most closely related to each other because their common ancestor is most recent. The common ancestor of pigeons and mice is way back here. So be careful with how things are sorted at the top of the cladogram. Make sure that you're looking backwards through time. Common ancestor, common ancestor traits that evolved um, over time. And again, this is called a cladogram. So natural selection is one of the mechanisms of evolution. Remember that we watched that amazing video, The Five Fingers of Evolution. That small finger uh, helps us remember that a small population is going to often lead to some evolution. We've got that ring finger for non-random mating. If organisms are choosing mates based on a particular kind of trait, that trait is more likely to persist in the population. Here we've got mutations. Mutations are, of course, going to introduce new alleles to a population. This one is all about gene flow, immigration and emigration, and then thumbs up for natural selection. So natural selection is survival of the fittest based on this idea of adaptations. And these adaptations are traits that allow individuals to survive in their environment and pass those traits on to their offspring. Those adaptations are going to allow those offspring to survive and have babies that also have those adaptations. So this idea of natural selection can occur only if there is some kind of variation within the species. If everything is a clone of everything else, then either everything survives or everything dies. So this idea of variation, here we've got some variation in a frog species, is going to allow for some things to be better suited to their environment and some things less suited. And so we will have natural selection happen. 
Um, this variation pops up in a couple different ways. Mutation, so when we have mistakes in DNA replication and new um, nucleotides are introduced to DNA sequences, to gene sequences, this is a mutation. Most of the, most of the time a mutation is going to be bad um, and we'll never even know it because those organisms will never persist in a population. But every once in a while those mutations make an organism super lucky and they are more likely to survive and, and have babies. Meiosis, uh, the, in, which occurs in the production of gametes, egg cells, and sperm cells, also leads to some variation because of this beautiful idea of crossing over and independent assortment. So we get all kinds of new um, collections of alleles. We have alleles that recombine in offspring, which might make organisms better suited to their environment. And then, of course, just the idea of sexual reproduction, where we are combining different kinds of um, alleles from different parents. Again, we've got new combinations of traits. This does also provide some variation. So, so what happens when organisms survive? They have more babies, they have more babies, they have more babies. We have this idea of carrying capacity because at some point all of these babies are going to run out of resources in their environment. So species do tend to produce more offspring than the environment can, can support. That uh, average number that can be supported by an environment is known as carrying capacity. Um, interesting to think about if we humans have a carrying capacity or not, or are we so smart? Are we able to find ways around carrying capacity? I don't really know. It's an interesting thought to, to think about. Um, know that in nature, we don't hit carrying capacity and stay exactly there. What usually happens is we have too many babies and then there's some starvation or some other terrible thing. And then a lot of the organisms die, but then there are more resources and so then they come back. And so it's not like I hit that line and stay there. It's really more of an average out to that carrying capacity number. Um, so, so again, evolution is that change in heritable characteristics of a species over time. Natural selection is going to increase the frequency of traits that make individuals better able to survive in their environment. And then it's going to decrease the frequency of those characteristics that do not allow organisms to survive. And so, again, we're going to have that evolution happen, that change in characteristics over time a lot of the time because of natural selection. Um, uh, here we have an example of, of natural selection of evolution occurring. So at, in this first generation, we've got 70% of the alleles, where that an allele is one form of a gene. 75% um, of the alleles in this population were green, and then 25% were this yellow, orangish, brownish color. Um, in the second generation, we had a, a different allele frequency, and so that's going to mean that evolution did occur. We had a change in, in characteristics, a change in the allele frequency over time. Genotype, phenotype, just a quick reminder, genotype is like big A, little a. What is the combination of your alleles? And then phenotype is the actual physical trait that you can see. Phys I did spell that right. That looked kind of weird. Physical trait that you can see if you are green or green and yellow. Good. Um, so some more examples of evolution. Darwin's finches, of course, give us a great example of evolution. Um, this particular idea is known as adaptive radiation, where we had this one common ancestor, the finch, and then they radiated out into lots of different species that all take advantage of different environments, different food sources. Antibiotic resistance in bacteria is another great example of evolution that's really bad for us. Um, basically, there are some bacteria that have a, a gene that allows them to survive antibiotic exposure. These bacteria are the ones that are going to survive that exposure to the antibiotic. They're going to pass that trait on to their offspring. Because there isn't a lot of competition for the few bacteria that survived, these guys will have lots and lots and lots of babies where that bacteria can reproduce through binary fission just about every 20 minutes or so. And then we're going to have huge populations of bacteria that are antibiotic resistant. Another way that antibiotic resistance can be passed to other bacteria is through conjugation. Um, it's the transfer of plasmid DNA between bacteria. Remember that most bacteria have their central chromosome, which is large and circular and naked, no histones. 
but bacteria also have these very small circles of DNA called plasmids. These plasmids will often have a gene for antibiotic resistance. They can make a copy of it and then via this process of conjugation, they can transfer that plasmid with the gene for antibiotic resistance to other bacteria. Um, that, that super cool structure that helps the bacteria attach to each other is of course, pilus is singular, pili is plural. All right, so finally, ethology, and we only have a couple slides on this one. We are almost done already, I promise. So ethology is a study of animal behavior, ideally in natural conditions, because our concern is that um, an artificial environment is going to change the behaviors of the organisms, so it's gonna be harder for us to study them. Um, this scientist, Natalia Brego, super cool. We're gonna watch some of her videos in class, um, but she studies lions and as much as she can, she tries to just be a an observer in a box here. Um, the lions are in a habitat that is similar to their natural environments. But then also she makes these weird boxes and she puts meat in them and she's trying to figure out the lions can learn and then teach each other how to get the meat out of the boxes. Um, so sometimes even when we are involved in ethology, which should be in natural conditions, we sometimes will add some artificial pieces just to uh, switch things up, add some variables, make things super interesting. Um, so natural selection is going to change the frequency of behaviors, just like we talked about it, changing the frequency of physical traits. Behaviors that are going to increase survival and then reproduction are going to become more frequent in a population. Baby birds do this thing where they open up their, their beaks and they yell really loudly. This leads to parents feeding them. Being fed is going to increase their chances of survival. And so baby birds have learned to do this. It increases their survival. These guys grow up, they lay their own eggs. Their babies are gonna do the same exact thing because again, survival. Uh, natural selection and behaviors can be learned or innate. Um, those uh, those baby birds, that was definitely an innate behavior. Um, this, these meerkats here in Africa, um, they learn how to be sentinels and some of them will stand watch while others are feeding. And if there is a predator, if there's some danger out there, these guys will make big noise, which is going to attract the predator to them. They are more likely to die themselves um, if they're warning the, the rest of their population. But this is going to be this, this kind of behavior, this altruism um, is going to benefit the whole population. And the assumption is that they're, these guys, their genes are in that population. And so even though they might get eaten by the predator, their genes will persist when they save the, uh, the rest of the population. So lots more examples of studies in ethology, and we are going to talk about these in class quite a bit more. Um, so looking at the breeding strategies of salmon, they swim upstream. Uh, synchronized estrus, this is mammals going into heat. So lions will actually go into heat at the same time um, in, their, in their groups, in their prides. Um, we can look at migratory patterns and how sometimes they change over time. We can look at, and this is a super cool one, how vampire bats will actually share blood uh, that they collected while they were feeding. We're gonna look at the foraging habits of some shore crabs. We're going to appreciate so much the dances of birds of paradise. Um, and then we'll look at these cute little birds. These are birds um, and they have learned how to open uh, milk bottles and drink milk out of humans' milk supplies. Um, good. So a uh, quick review, our objectives, what we have accomplished today. We did definitely review a lot of evolution and natural selection. We defined ethology, the study of animal behavior, preferably in their natural environment, but sometimes we, we humans definitely change that environment just a little bit, um, especially looking at behaviors that are selected for by natural selection, those behaviors that allow organisms to better survive and pass those behaviors on to their offspring. And that, my friends, is our lecture for today. Good work.